Okay, so first, before we talk about kind of the institutional legacy that we have from slavery and from white supremacy in general, we need to talk about this idea of identity and how that's connected to economics and to the public sector specifically. Um, so the reason we care about this um, is you're learning all sorts of economic principles in this class. Um, some of them are less important than others, like you can calculate the elasticity, hooray. Um, but that's not super important compared to other issues that we care about more. And so one of the things that we've been talking about a lot throughout the semester is this idea of institutions. Um, and your job as a public servant as, or as somebody who works in the nonprofit sector is essentially to make sure that the plumbing of the capitalist system and of, of the, the policy world keeps working, um, that um, public goods are provided and externalities are fixed and monopolies are curtailed um, and information is provided. That's kind of what the government does to make sure that the magic capitalist um, invisible hand can do its work. Um, which is why we also care about public goods provision. Um, if you don't have institutions that make it so public goods can be provided, then it's going to be messy and it's not going to be, um, you're not going to have access to, to all the public goods that you need, especially when we start talking about this idea of redistribution and fairness and, and equity. We want everybody to be able to have access to public goods and the fixes to externalities and to the protections we get against monopolies um, and access to information. All of these market failures that we fix, we need to make sure that that is accessible to everyone. Um, that's kind of the goal of a public servant um, who knows about economic principles, and that's kind of what we're mostly concerned about in this class. Um, the reason we're care we care about these more than like elasticity and um, changes in supply and changes in demand is that when these three things fall apart, um, then society starts breaking. Um, so if you have a lack of institutions, um, then you essentially get to this world where nobody trusts each other. Um, if you think about it in stag hunt language, um, everybody's defecting, everybody's just um, off hunting for their own hares. Um, and looking out for their own self-interest instead of the interest of society as a whole, where you'll actually get a higher payoff. If everybody hunts the stag simultaneously and cooperates, um, you get way more food than if everybody goes off their own separate ways and picks up hares. Um, and so you need these institutional structures to encourage cooperation and encourage um, people working together. Um, and so we, like, we need the institutional glue to make sure society sticks together. Um, if there's not enough public goods provision, then there's going to be an under provision of public goods. You'll have monopolies, you'll have um, a lack of public goods, you'll have too many externalities, you'll have um, information asymmetries, and you'll have all sorts of um, bad situations that make the market less um, efficient and less equitable. Um, and what we end up with is um, if we have this under provision of public goods and under institutionalization, um, then um, what, what that really means in practice is that it doesn't mean that there will be no public goods provided whatsoever or there will be no protection from monopolies or no protection from externalities. What it really means is that the people with power and the people with money will gain access to public goods and protection from externalities. Um, so the people with more money and power and status will have more protection against uh, pollution. They'll have more access to information about uh, purchasing vehicles. They'll have more access to um, any sort of public good, um, while those with less power will not. Um, and that's kind of a, a bad situation. You don't want a, a society where um, the playing field is not necessarily level um, and there are people who just can't access public goods because of lack of money or because of um, a lack of trust or anything like that. And so we care about all three of these things. Um, and one way to get at this here um, is this idea of creating what is called a shared national identity. Um, there's lots of economic research and political science research um, looking across lots of different countries that shows that one of the greatest predictors of having um, kind of good, strong public goods provision um, and having um, a, a bigger, more equitable social safety net um, is a shared national identity. And that does not mean one homogenous society where everybody's identical. Um, you'll often hear that like um, Denmark is really good at being Denmark and being one of the happiest countries in the world because all of the Danes are the same ethnically and they don't have minorities and so they can do that. That is not the case. Um, Denmark has lots of minority and immigrant populations. 
um, the issue there is that there's kind of a stronger national identity around um, Danishness or around Norwegianness or Swedishness, um, and it's not directly mapped onto race and the the ethnicities where you come from. And so as a result, um, countries that have kind of lower levels of this this political science idea here, this ethno fractionalization, which is just divisions in society based on ethnic groups, um, ethnic divisions and racial divisions, um, countries with less of that um, have stronger welfare systems and have better provision of public goods, have stronger institutions and have um, more equal outcomes in society. And so we care about this um, because that's kind of our ultimate goal as public servants is to make sure this kind of thing happens. And so we want um, kind of less ethno fractionalization and more um, kind of institution or institutional power and um, better public goods provision. That's what we care about as public servants. Um, but what we what happens is if you don't live in a society where you have this strong national identity, um, you get into this this bad um, positive feedback loop here, where if you start off with unequitable public policies um, that are fa that favor one group over another, then there will be decreased public goods provision for all of society. Um, the people with power um, who benefit from the unequitable unequitable public policies will then reshape that power. Um, or reshape society in their favor. And we talked about this when we talked about institutions, and we had the Polya's urn example, um, where we had the blue Lego and the red Lego, and if you choose one of them, you put another one that's the same in there. Um, if you have power over the bowl, you're going to purposely choose the Legos you want and reshape kind of the existing institutional um, um, a menu that you can use um, to provide public goods and to kind of provide for society. And so as a result, there's unequal access to institutions. Um, people who are left out of the institutions can't help reshape those institutions in their favor. And then that leads to increased fractionalization. Um, and there's more resentment and more division in society where um, people who are left out are even more left out. Um, which then leads to more unequitable public, unequitable public policies, which restarts the cycle. And so eventually you'll get kind of one overarching class of people in society that has all of the power and privilege and money, um, and they have all of the say in how public policy is set, um, and people, more and more people get left out of the provision of public goods, um, which is not something we necessarily want as public servants. Our goal is to serve the public and... and pursue justice and equity, this does not lead to equity, this cycle here. And so what we want to do is be able to break this cycle and somehow increase public goods provisions by increasing access to institutions and decreasing fractionalization here. Um, and so that brings us to this, this notion we have in the United States specifically of whiteness and how that has shaped um, the public policy world. Um, as you saw in this Twitter thread here, um, we have huge underinvestment in public goods. Um, we have unequitable public policies. We are in this loop right here. Um, when we talked about externalities, um, we talked about how the, the consequences of pollution are not borne by everybody. Um, EPA Superfund sites tend to be located in minority communities. Um, and it's not because the minorities are flocking to the Superfund sites. It's because the pollution is happening there because uh, companies get get government approval to dump their stuff there um, and they get government approval because there's minority communities and the government allows that. Um, and so as a result, we have this strong ethno-fractionalist split um, where kind of white America in general um, tries to withhold um, public goods and, and kind of the benefits that you get from being in a society from black America here and um, as evidenced by this thread here and as evidenced by society in general. Um, and part of this is because of American history and the way it has been structured from the beginning. Um, where this, this idea of who gets to count as a citizen or who, ca who gets to count as an American has not been clear cut and has not been kind of an open, expansive definition. And so if you look at the history of who gets to be an American, um, even from the beginning, um, the Catholics, even before America was a country and it was just a, a collection of British colonies, um, Catholics had to have their own colonies. Maryland was its own place because um, Catholics were not allowed in Massachusetts and New York and Pennsylvania and other places. 
um, because there was lots of anti-Catholic sentiment. Even up until the, like the 1960s when JFK ran for president, um, there was lots of anti-Catholic sentiment when he was running. Um, and so over the past hundred plus years, um, Catholics have had to kind of reshape their identity in America to prove that they count as American, that they count as white enough um, to be an American. The Irish went through the same um, process um, when they started immigrating in the early 1800s um, during the Great Potato Famine. Um, they were not incorporated into um, Anglo-Saxon America, Protestant America. One, they were, I they were Catholic, and two, they were Irish, and the, the English colonists or ancestors of the descendants of the English colonists didn't like the Irish. And so you have all sorts of signs of like Irish not welcome here. Um, they were kind of pushed off into specific neighborhoods in large cities, um, but eventually they kind of um, reshaped their community to become more American. Um, and more white. It was a racial transformation, um, not to the same extent as like um, the, the black-white split or the African-American split. Um, but back in the 1800s, um, caricatures of Catholics and Irish and Italians and other groups were highly racialized um, because they didn't count as white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. And so they could not fit in society and they did not benefit from um, the larger public provi public provision of public goods and externality protection and monopoly protection um, and access to institutions. So the Italians had to go through the same process. <clears throat> um, Chinese were did not um, get to count themselves as white in the end. Um, they faced even harsher penalties um, because in the end, even though um, Catholics, Irish, and Italians, these groups um, were coded in um, uh, political cartoons and kind of the popular press in the 1800s, they were coded as non-white in, in their pictures. Uh, they were still kind of if in the racial hierarchy of the 1800s, um, they were up higher than other racial groups. And so there were actual laws that banned Chinese immigration. There was the Chinese Exclusion Act um, and several other acts that limited Chinese immigration completely in the 1800s. Um, Japanese went through a similar process and um, uh, lots of Japanese families prior to World War II had kind of made a name for themselves in their communities, had kind of uh, claimed this this mantle of being white and American and being capitalist and fitting in society. But then after Pearl Harbor happened, um, Japanese internment happened and they were kind of uprooted from their communities, put in internment camps, and um, this notion of being an American um, went away. Um, African Americans and uh, that we'll talk about in the second half of this. Um, that has been a long-standing uh, centuries-long battle to um, gain access to public institutions and gain access to um, the ability to get public goods and to be protected from externalities and other things. And it has not been successful because there's been extreme resistance from um, kind of the more settled white American classes that kind of get to determine who is who is allowed. Um, and then the last thing we'll talk about in just a minute, um, the really fascinating part about the split here is that it is highly arbitrary. Um, when, so like in the census now, if you took the census earlier in 2020, um, you had to choose your race and you could choose different races. And lots of them were based on kind of races that were established in the 1800s because we still have that legacy with us institutionally. Um, but specific um, ethnic groups would lobby to gain, um, to be considered either white or non-white. Um, the Middle East especially had this issue um, where Egyptian immigrants um, had to lobby to become either, to be classified as either white or non-white. Um, Syrian immigrants also had to battle it out. Lebanese immigrants had to battle it out. And it was not always kind of equally given. Some Middle Eastern groups were considered white, some were not. Um, it just depended on kind of the lobbying power of their their different um, lobbyists and people working with Congress and with the Census Office, which is totally bizarre. Um, but that's kind of how the this this racial hierarchy was embedded in the in the census system um, and in the 1800s and 1900s in America. 
Um, and so all of these groups kind of went through this, this weird process or did not go through the process to kind of code themselves as white and counting as American enough. Um, and so one case study of this where a group did make it, um, but it, there's still weird ramifications of that today, is actually the Mormons. Um, so the Mormons were a religious group that started in New York um, in 1830-ish, and then they moved um, to Illinois, and then they were kicked out of Illinois and moved to Utah. Um, and so Brigham Young um, of Brigham Young University, BYU, um, he was kind of the, the leader of the Mormon church in Utah. Um, and one unique aspect of Mormonism back in the 1800s was polygamy. Um, and so there were lots of Mormon polygamists, and they had multiple wives. And they were looked down on by greater American Anglo-Saxon society um, to the point that they were racialized and otherized in the popular press. Um, Utah took so long to become a state, they were not admitted into the United States until 1896 because um, the Senate refused to allow Utah in because of polygamy and because of um, they were seen like if you look at op-eds at the time, they were like labeled as non-white barbarians because they had multiple wives. Um, and so it, it became this really strange thing um, where kind of they look like in our notion of like what a white person looks like, they were Swedish immigrants and English immigrants. Um, but in the press, in, uh, in cartoons, they were not portrayed that way. Um, and in op-eds and in reporting at the time, they were not portrayed that way. They were portrayed as another race. They were inserted in the, the dumb 19th century racial hierarchy. Um, and so we'll look at a, a few examples of that and how that reversed. But the main point of this is that the full benefits of citizenship, um, meaning access to institutions, access to public goods, has been contingent on this notion of whiteness throughout American history. Um, and so Amer or Mormons will look at this case study really quick of how that journey happened. So right now, typically when you think of Mormons, you think of like white families. This guy right here, Mitt Romney, he's a senator right now, ran for president in 2012. This is his, um, all of his grandkids here. Um, it's kind of like the prototypical giant white family. Um, he does have an adopted daughter or adopted granddaughter here. Um, his kids adopted an a African-American girl. Um, and but like this is kind of like cookie cutter Mormondom right here. Um, but that has not always been the case. Um, this is a kind of terrifying political cartoon from 1904 um, when the popular press still um, labeled Mormons as kind of this racial other. Um, they were polygamists. And so if you look at this, um, the caricatures of all of this guy's kids, the, the caption here is says, Elder Mormon Barry, which is the, the name they made up for the guy, out with his six-year-olds who take after their mothers. And the really interesting thing here is this is symbolic cartoon, but what it's trying to show is that this Mormon guy who's kind of dark and shifty um, had betrayed the white race by marrying um, a Scottish lady, a Native American lady, a Chinese lady. She's coded as something. Um, and so you have all of these different races, the, the, the racial categories from the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, in the reporting, it said that kind of this guy was a, a race traitor um, because of the polygamist mixing across races, which is awful. Um, and this has been go had been going on for a long time. One really interesting thing here is the National Republican Party, um, the GOP that we have today, it was started in 1860 um, with uh, Abraham Lincoln. He was their first um, candidate. Um, and the, the Republican platform was built on what they called the t abolishing the twin relics of barbarism. Um, one of the relics of barbarism that they wanted to abolish um, was, not surprisingly, slavery. Um, and so that was kind of the whole foundation of the Re Republican Party here was to eliminate slavery. Um, and then this led to the Civil War after Lincoln won. Um, but the other relic of barbarism they wanted to get rid of was polygamy, um, which was specifically put in there um, targeting the Mormons, who by that time were in Utah, um, which is totally fascinating. So like from the beginning, um, the GOP here has been interested in, or was interested back then in, in abolishing slavery, but also abolishing polygamy. Both of these ideas were linked racially. It wasn't two separate ideas. Um, polygamy was seen as kind of 
something that went against the white race at the time. Um, so if you look at kind of different political cartoons from the time, um, you can see here that like Utah, the Mormons there are sucking in these these white immigrants from um, from Europe who are then bidding, being put to work in the Great Salt Lake in the desolation of the Great Salt Lake. Here's all of them kind of um, being um, worked really, really hard. And you have these overseers who are very dark complexion looking at them. Um, and overseeing them, and it's basically just this giant trap for the innocent white women from New England and from the old world, from England and, and Norway. Um, and so again, this is like highly racially coded using the, the, the artistry from the 1900s, 1800s here. Um, it even got to the point where Mormons were encoded in race-based science. And so back in the 1800s, there was this idea of physiognomy, where you could classify people's races by looking at their facial features and measuring their heads. Um, and you could classify personalities and IQ and intelligence, all sorts of awful stuff um, that then this whole world became the foundation for like eugenics and awful scientific stuff later. Um, but if you look at textbooks from physiognomy um, classes back then, um, you can see here, there's these two pictures. This guy's Brigham Young. Um, this is uh, Margaret Osoli, who was famous in the mid-1800s for um, falling off of a boat because her lover fell off of a boat, and it was this tragic love story. And so people loved this idea of kind of the, the like she would prefer to drown rather than leave her husband. It was this sad, tragic love story. And so what this textbook shows is by looking at their actual like facial characteristics in their eyes, um, they are linked to personality types. And so if you look here, her eye has low polyeroticity, which means she's not prone to love more than one person, which is very similar to a turtle dove. Um, while Brigham Young here, he has high polyeroticity, um, which is very shifty and is more like a pig or a hog. And so it actually like maps on facial features um, to animals or, who are out in the world. Mormons were not the only ones who had textbooks written about them. You also had Irish physiognomy and um, black physiognomy and Native American physiognomy. Um, this whole physiognomy world was invented to kind of add scientific credibility to a racial hierarchy that was created back then. Um, which was not great for, again, the public provision or the provision of public goods and letting people access um, kind of the benefits that you get from society. Um, groups were locked out because of this weird race based science here that proved um, that Mormons had shifty eyes. Um, and so as a result, um, what Mormons did, there's a whole bunch of cool research, um, really interesting historical research that traces how Mormons were able to essentially tie themselves to um, evangelicals, um, white evangelicals, and be able to recast themselves as white and respectable. Um, and so in the 1950s, um, Lots of Mormon leaders were welcomed into government. Um, the Secretary of Agriculture in the 1950s was a guy named Ezra Taft Benson, who later became a Mormon, the top Mormon prophet leader. Um, but that kind of marked the, the welcoming of Mormons into um, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, Anglo -Saxon Pro Protestant world. Um, it wasn't complete. If you remember from the, the 2012 um, election where Mitt Romney ran for president, there was lots of... Um, anti-Mormon sentiment against him, um, but it wasn't incredibly strong. Um, it was mostly just some white evangelicals in the South saying we can never vote for a Mormon, but most of the rest of the country was like, fine, he's Mormon, whatever. Um, and it was fine. Um, so the really interesting thing about this is that Mormons, um, like the Irish and other ethnic groups, um, were able to prove their whiteness and gain access to kind of political and economic institutions um, as a whole. Lots of other groups have done this. We can actually see the consequences of, the, of it. Um, the fact that we celebrate Columbus Day in the United States was part of a lobbying effort of the Italian community in the early 1900s to prove that they were white enough to be American as well because Christopher Columbus discovered America and so he counts and so we can include the Italian community. Um, the fact that we over celebrate St. Patrick's Day is a similar thing. Um, St. Patrick's Day is celebrated in Ireland, um, but it, they don't like um, dye their rivers green and go wild with shamrocks and getting drunk and stuff. That's 
a very American thing to do. Um, but now we teach it in elementary school um, because it's kind of our national heritage. We have lots of Irish people here and we love the Irish. Um, and that's because of lots of lobbying and work from the Irish community in the 1800s and early 1900s to convince greater society that they count as, count as American. And so they were able to kind of gain access to society here. Um, so that's kind of how this has worked, um, looking at ethno-fractionalization in the United States. Um, in order to gain access to getting good public goods, um, to getting good access to schools, to getting good access to business opportunities, um, you've essentially had to prove that you are white enough and Anglo-Saxony enough and Protestant enough to get, to get that access. Um, if you don't, then that sucks for your group and there are huge glaring exceptions for this um, and as a result we have all sorts of um, racial and ethnic and um, uh, or sub-national fractionalization in the United States because of this. Um, Native Americans have not been you know, allowed into this greater structure. Um, Black America has not been allowed in here. Um, Asian Americans have not been allowed in here. Um, which is not great for um, if we're thinking about equal access to society um, and if we're thinking about fairness and justice and equity, um, there are whole groups of society that are left out of this. And so how do we fix that? Um, and that's what we'll talk about in the next section.